And welcome to another Airship 27 podcast. This is podcast number 30. I'm your co-host, Rob Davis, here alongside my co-host, Ron Fortier. Howdy, everybody. Uh, This is going to be a fun show. Rob and I uh, just came back from one of the best pulp conventions we ever attended. But before we get into that, Captain Ron has... Is the normal Airship 27 Zone 4 commercial <laughs> that we have to read in, in our way of saying thanks to the people who help bring this show to you every month. We are proud members of the Comics Podcast Network. You can find us every every episode of the Airship 27 podcast, all 30 of them as of today, on comicpodcast.com each and every month. You can also find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Comic Frontline, YouTube, and of course the Zone 4 podcast. And uh, <laughs> by the end of the show, Rob, remind me please if I forget while mm-hmm. going through our agenda for this month. But uh, in regards to where we can be found, the history of the podcast, all of those kinds of things, we have a little special announcement about the Zone 4 family of podcasts that I want to pass along to our listeners. Okay. So, Yeah, so we'll save that for the end, my friend. All right. (laughs) All right. So, hey, look, I wrote it up on the agenda. Uh, We can follow through it. Uh, You can go ahead and start with reading it. And, you know, we're going to keep this, as we do all our shows, rather informal uh, and talk about what a real great time we had in Pittsburgh. So why don't you kick that off? I will kick it off. Uh, Pulp Fest in Pittsburgh. Uh, we, we want to take a little time to talk about the show and how much fun we had there. Seeing lots of our regular friends such as, and we're probably going to leave somebody out here, Mark Halegua, Frank Schildine, Schildiner, Wynn Scott Eckerd, Michael Croteau, I'm not sure if that's pronounced right, but it's Croteau or Croteau, and Barbara Moran, Will Patrick Maynard, and his son Michael, Fred Adams Jr., and a bunch of other folks. Now, our next-door neighbors at the show... At the table next to us were Jim Beard and John Bruning. Uh, finally, getting to shake hands with colleagues Micah Harris, Jim Simcoe, and Wayne Carey, who was there with his wife, Brenda. Uh, two, two folks who, who uh, we had not met before, it, it, and that, they were kind of fun to meet. And we also got to meet some new writers, uh, such as Charles Mill, Millhouse. All in all, a really fantastic show. Great weekend. Oh, it, it was. I, I was really taken... Um, I, I really liked the hotel where they held the show as far as um, the rooms, okay, for the uh, other right. activities, the panel rooms and all that. Yes. Uh, although, I, and, and, you know, I mean, obviously there were a heck of a lot more vendors at this show than we've seen at Columbus. <laughs> well, yes, the, the, the floor was a lot tighter. I, th- I think the room was, if anything, was maybe, maybe a slight bit smaller, but not much. But they had us. They had us uh, wedged in there pretty tight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, right. Because normally we put up this huge black banner that you had built and created for us uh, for Columbus and Windy City, and whereas we have island tables, and for those of our loyal uh, airmen who don't know what that refers to, when you go to a convention, if you have a table against a wall, so that the wall is your backup. That's called a wall table. If you are in the middle of the floor, that's an island table. And generally what most conventions will do is they'll put creators back to back in lines, going perpendicular, horizontal, whichever way they want to set up the huckster's room. And so generally they leave us enough space that we're back to back with other (laughs) vendors where they can put up their banners and we can put up our banners. Well, that wasn't the case in this particular hall because it was obvious, and and to their credit, uh, the con 
really did get a lot more vendors at this particular show. There were people that, you know, Rob and I had never seen setting up at, at Pulp Fest, but in pushing everybody together, when Rob was setting up our table, it became all too obvious there was no way we could put up our back banner. It would be falling down on top of our neighbors behind us, and they came to the same exact conclusion themselves. Because uh, didn't they have a giant plywood banner, they, Rob? They did. They had a, they had a, a plywood backdrop. They they brought they dragged in and we're going to try and set up. And here I was trying to set up our black uh, backdrop, and I, I gave up. I, I hated having to drag it along and then not be able to use it. But at the same time, it would have just been it would have been in the way. And so would their plywood thing. They ended up taking it back outside as well. But uh, we did fine. We had we had as always. We have really uh, we had friendly neighbors. And we got along just fine, even even though we were kind of wedged in there like uh, sardines. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, well, yeah, you know, and, and, and you know, and, and what you've already you know said, I, I, I want to reiterate on some of those points because uh, I think they're worth mentioning too. Um, several years ago, both Richard Bruning and Jim Beard got together to to create their own publishing imprint, which is called Flinch Books. Right. Yeah. And both these guys have been uh, longtime friends of ours in Airship 27. Uh, Jim, as a writer who's done many things for us in the past, and John, who was, when we first got started, was one of our early proofreaders. Right. So it was really, really, really cool a couple of years ago to see him start this, this new line, you know, and their new company. And since then, I mean, I've had the pleasure of reading two or three of their anthologies and novels and they are doing a great job so you know to all our, our faithful listeners out there uh aside from you know hey always wanting to promote airship 27 titles just be aware that there are a lot of other like, excellent new pulp books being published every day out there in, in the field by our colleagues and and you know friendly competitors if you will high amongst those these days is flinch books so Check them out on, you know, Google them. Go to Amazon, check out their books. I think you'll be happy. And it, w- it was a real joy for us to be next to them this year because it gave us an opportunity to catch up a little bit. Oh, yeah. And then uh, <laughs> old, old time, old time friends like Mark Allegra, who hadn't been to a show in what, three years, maybe, Rob? Yeah, I, yeah, it's, it's at least two, probably three. But yeah, it was it was very good to see him again, and and because uh, he he was one of those he was at the very first Windy City we went to, if I recall right. correctly, right? And uh, you had I guess you had seen him at, at Pulp PulpCon, had you seen yes. him because you you and he were familiar with each other because you were pestering each other. He's a he's a Yankees fan and you're a Red Sox fan, so of course that, that that's the oil and water. <laughs> so, oh, so. oh yes, the, the friendly banter between the two of us. Yeah. Oh yes, uh, yeah, which started from the first time we did meet at uh, the PulpCon way back in Dayton, all those years ago. But Mark, Mark is really a great guy and and a, a real authority on, on pulp history, a, a great deal. So again, it was really fun seeing him and catching up. And he's always got a bunch of stories to share with us. Um, again, looking through the list, and as you said at the beginning. To any of our uh, pulp friends who were at the con that we had the opportunity to see and share some time with, uh, our deepest apologies if we forgot to mention you. But it seemed like this year there were so many of, of our, you know, old pulp friends. And then, then the opportunity to meet uh, people that we've only, you know, known online uh, or, pub- or even published in our books. And that latter, I mean, includes... People like Micah Harris, who uh, did the um, Ravenwood novel for us, Rob. Right. Yeah. And right. And then there was John Simcoe, who was one of the writers on our Legends of New Pulp Fiction. Yeah. And Wayne Carey, who is um, doing. Um, I'm trying to. Oh yeah, the new Alan Quatermain novel that we got coming. Right. Uh, next. So again, uh, you know, these people were a lot of fun to hook up with, and I. I got not only to meet a lot of them on the floor at pan at, at you know presentations or whatever, but Wayne was actually on my new pulp panel Saturday afternoon, and I did want to spend a few minutes talking about how much fun that was. Every year, it's, it's been a joy and an honor for me to moderate that particular panel. 
It's held every Saturday afternoon since the, I think since the second year of the convention when Mike Chomko asked me to do that. Right. And that's the thing about that, that both of us really appreciate both from the committee at Pulp Fest and the folks at Windy City is that they've been very receptive and very supportive of the new pulp and allowing us to do, you know, readings and this new pulp panel is one of the way that Columbus does that. So this year I was lucky in that I had five writers <laughs> up on, on the panel, all right, which which made for some really interesting and fun discussions. But they were it was the first time for all of them at the new pulp panel for Pulp Fest. Now, I worked with Fred Adams in the past on other panels but in Chicago, but never here in uh, for Pulp Fest in Pittsburgh, just, you know, this particular show. So, you know, recalling in my mind how the panel was set up, uh, we had Michael Maynard, who is our good friend, William Maynard's son, right. who is a high school student, <laughs> all right, and easily the youngest writer we've ever had on a panel. And... Boy, is that encouraging, Rob? You know what I mean? To to have new blood like that, and and he's following right in his, his dad's footsteps as far as being a talented creator. Then next to him, we had Charles Milhouse, uh, who was again new to our community and, and the cons. And I I don't know if I shared that story with you or not during the convention week, but Charles is actually from the Columbus area. Oh, okay. All right. And has been writing his own uh, pulp adventures of a space opera character called Captain Hawkins. Uh, he's been doing this for years. <laughs> I believe he has five or six novels out. And only found <laughs> only found out about Pulp Fest after it left Columbus last <laughs> year. <laughs> so now he had to travel all the way. To, you know, all the years we were in Columbus, <laughs> poor Charles never knew the con was there. The year we moved to Pittsburgh, somebody finally got word to him and said, well, did you know there was a pulp convention right down here in, you know, downtown? Oh, he was a little bit upset, but to his credit, <laughs> to his credit, packed his bags and came to uh, Pittsburgh with his wife and joined us, and, and I got him up on the panel. He's a great guy. He, he is very outgoing. He's a lot of fun, and it was a ball having him on the panel. Then we had our old stalwart amigo, none other than Fred Adams Jr., uh, who's who's become one of the cornerstones, I think, of, of Airship Twenty Seven, Rob. Yeah, uh, well, he's yeah, last. he's given us a lot of uh, several novels and a bunch of different uh, short stories. He, he's right. just he's just uh, a whirlwind when it comes to writing stories. Well, yeah, <laughs> that, that's all because what I learned from moderating him on, on the pulp uh, on the new pulp panel, if you will, when he was talking uh, about his past, he spent, I, I don't know, something like 30 years or whatever as a uh, English composition uh, teacher in a, in a college. So, I mean, literally he said he spent those years teaching thousands of people how to write. But that gave him very little, you know, time or energy left, for that matter, to do his own writing when you think about that. And so once he retired just several years ago, uh, I got it immediately. I, and I understood it. And I, I laughed. I quipped with him about, so finally the damn burst loose. And he went, <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And again, we've been the happy recipients of that damn fight. Absolutely. Like, yeah. Yeah, the man has a lot of stories to tell, and we have a lot more on the way, believe me. They're always a lot of fun to have. And so, going back to the panel, next to Fred, again, John Bruning, uh, who's a lot of fun. And John published his very first New Pulp novel last year, which was nominated for a Pulp Factory Award, and that was The Midnight Guardian. And John is, is an affable guy, and it was a lot of fun talking with him about after years of editing and sitting behind the desk wearing that hat, now he's on the writing end of things and, and having the time of his life as he should. And we ended the panel with Wayne Carey, a really talented, talented uh, writer in his own right. And the thing when, when you do panels is you get these mix of personalities. And as, as I had told you after the panel, when I came back to our table, we were sitting down talking 
of the five up there, we had three whose personality I would describe as as outgoing, as, as extroverted <laughs> in, in some way or another, uh-huh. and two who were more on the reserve side, just, just you know, <laughs> a bit more reserved. But when they all came into the hall, along with the audience, and we had a very good audience, and, and I'm always appreciative of that, uh, I basically told them, you know, hey, go on up to the stage and, and grab a chair and, you know, let's get the mics on. And thanks to Michael, man, because none of us knew how to work that equipment. Mike, <laughs> Michael, you know, his age or whatever, understood it, came down, plugged us all in. The microphones worked nice and well. But Michael took one end chair, and Wayne took the other end chair, and they were the two who were the, the most, I would say, you know, quiet of, of the five up at the at – the, uh, table at the stage so it was an interesting mix and we got to talk about a lot a lot of different subjects about fiction writing new pulp what brings people to it and everything else so uh again i want to thank mike chomko and everybody else at at the pulp fest committee for giving us that opportunity to um to have these these new pulp panels and introduce you know the audiences at the con to some of the writers working in the field today um one of the things I, I oftentimes, Rob, start this particular panel with is an anecdote to the effect of what, what would have, what would it be like for all of us who enjoy this kind of material, this kind of fiction, if we could take a time machine and travel back to, say, 1935, you know, in downtown New York, maybe, and, and go to some convention where we'd have Walter Gibson, you know, the creator of The Shadow, Lester Dent, the creator of Doc Savage, Paul Chadwick, creator of Secret Agent X, you know, the, the list goes on, and have them all sitting together <laughs> on a panel talking about what they do. I mean, wow, that would be like the ultimate rush for any real pulp fan. And so, you know, in hindsight, they didn't have those kind of conventions when the pulps were in their heyday. And hopefully, you know, we've been able to correct a little bit of that with what we do with New Pulp. And I'd like to hope that in years to come, uh, when a lot of our attendees, you know, look back on their experiences traveling to pulp conventions, you know, they could sit back and say, oh, God, I remember that year when, when Ron had blah, blah, blah all together on the same stage, you know. So there you go. It's hard, uh, pre- hard predicting the future. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, okay. but, you know, we, we, we're, hopefully we're making a little history, but it, we're at least having some fun along the way. <laughs> that, that we are. That we are. Um, I mean, and we, you and I, this year, I, again, I'm, I'm tipping my fedora to, to the folks who put this show on, but you and I attended a couple of uh, uh, night presentations, and yes. one, of, one of them by this lady who was 93 years old, and forgive me if I, I don't remember her name, uh, but was one of the actual artists who worked in the uh, pulps during their last days in, in the 50s, early 50s, and she worked on I mean, the slideshow she, uh, David Saunders the son of, of the great Norm Saunders was the uh, host of that presentation and interviewed her on stage, and they had a slideshow, and they showed tons of stuff that she'd done in her career. Wasn't that absolutely amazing? Yeah, it's. I'm pulling up the while we're, while you're talking there. I'm pulling up the uh, the uh, website. See if I can find her name. She was the special guest, mm-hmm. and I cannot remember her name either. Uh, was that did, that was that on Saturday that she was there? Yes, it was. Okay, so Saturday evening. Uh, it was after the business meeting. Guest of honor presentation. Gloria Stoll Carn. There you go. Gloria Stoll Karn. She was, and I'm, I'm going to read for, straight from the website. Uh, I, for Saturday evening, we'll include our guest of honor presentation featuring one of the few living pulp magazine artists, Gloria Stoll Karn. A Pittsburgh resident, Gloria will be joined by fine artist and pulp art historian David Saunders, winner of our 2016 Lamont Award, to discuss her freelance career in the pulps and much more. In a field dominated by men, it was highly unusual for a woman to be painting covers for pulp magazines. But at, and here's the wild part, but at age 17, Gloria Stoll began contributing black and white interior illustrations to pulp magazines. In a few years, the young artist was painting covers. How's that 
for a dangerous dame, which was the theme <laughs> of the of Pulp Fest this year was dangerous dames. That's right. just amazing. She started at age seventeen. That's oh. wild. Oh, it was, and I mean, uh, again, like I'm saying, her forte and, and most of the paintings we saw were actual Western romance pulps, <laughs> right? And right. Again, that's yeah. the, the beauty of pulps, right? The mashups that they did, but then mixed among them were these horror covers. Oh these yeah, mystery covers. The one with the uh, the woman screaming and the skeletal hands coming around her neck. Right, yeah. I, I was just blown away. She's the short little lady, vibrant, full of energy, yeah. and, and and so nonplussed at actually being up there, okay? And I think Rob obviously humbled and a little surprised that there was a hall of people so interested in her career and <laughs> in the field that she worked in. Yes. And then by the time her presentation was over, uh, she she received, I think, the loudest and the longest uh, ovation I have ever heard given at a pulp convention. Yeah, not mentioned here in this paragraph that I just read is also, after she stopped doing uh, uh, pulp covers, she went on to do some, uh, some uh, more modern paintings, uh, it, that non-representational stuff. And it, it, they, they had slides of some of her work, some really interesting, thought-provoking uh, pieces of artwork. Uh, so she had a very varied career. I mean, like you said, she did the romance stuff, and then she did some of the horror stuff, which she called her her shadow, uh, her, her dark her dark <laughs> side. That. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Her shade, and yeah. and and. The, but she also went on to do some more, like I said, non representational artwork later on, uh, and and did very well at that as well. So uh, she had she had quite the career. Oh, she she was a joy to listen to. She Absolutely. really was. Yep. I mean, it's 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 nice to know that you know. I mean, there are still people alive today. We're ninety three, spry as a fiddle. Okay. <laughs> All right. Who had these great memories and was so kind enough to come to the convention and share them with all of us. All right, Absolutely. it's just yep. it's, it was like it was like she gave us a a peek into what that world was like. She did. Yes. Yeah. And Great so there story. you go, loyal uh, airmen. Uh, again, we have a lot of other stories uh, we could share with you, but uh, hey, we'll save those for another show for sure because we've got our regular agenda to get to. One of the things that we did want to talk about and why we always you know, share with you some of the fun we had at pulp conventions is, again, to, to, you know, to once again urge you, if you ever have an opportunity to attend a pulp convention, whether it's Windy City in Chicago or now Pittsburgh uh, for Pulp Fest. And, you know, let's not forget uh, our friend Martin Grimes, who was at the show. Martin deals with nostalgia, and he has a show called the Nostalgia Con, which is held up in New Jersey. And last but not least, our buddy Rich Harvey, uh, who runs Pulp Adventures magazine, has a Pulp Adventure Con that takes place in the fall in Florida. So there are... There are several pulp conventions geared to, to this kind of old pulp collection, paper collecting, and whatnot. And if you're within any you know area close to these locales, uh, we really, really urge you to go. You will have a really great time. It's a lot of fun. The, the people who put them on are congenial, outgoing. The vendors are a lot of fun. And it, it's, it's more back to the core of what people collect. <laughs> Unlike the big uh, comic cons today that have become more or less media uh, experiences and whatever, pop cons are still very much cued to the collecting and the experience of, of the pulps. So, there you go. All right. Hey, since our last show, Rob, uh, why don't you pick up on what we put out and what we just recently released? Okay. Uh, our newest titles just released in the past week were two more books we mentioned on our last episode. First, we had Tales from the Hanging Monkey, Volume 2. This an anthology is set in pre-World War II South Seas. It centers on a rowdy bar on the island of Motugra. The concept was put together by writer Bill Craig, and he wrote the Bible, which we then shared with our other writers at the Pulp Factory. In this volume, we have four new stories, each starring one of the rogues in Bill's setup. 
uh, the writers are Don Gates, J. Walt Lane, Bill himself, and last was co-written by Nancy Hansen and Lee Houston Jr. The interior illustrations were done by uh, pro artist Michael Harris, and yours truly put together the the the, uh, the fun pulpish cover from an idea by by Ron. And if you remember that old short short lived TV show Tales from the Gold Monkey then you are going to love Tales from the Hanging Monkey. <laughs> Again, both it and Volume 1 are available from Amazon in both paperback and on Kindle. Right. I, I want to mention, because when we got the book out last week and we promoted it all over the Internet, as we always do, uh, we showed off that great cover that you did, Rob. And, you know, as, <coughs> as with Volume Number 1, uh, a lot of people happily who are old enough get the connection with the old TV show <laughs> but we want to keep that clear it's okay to get the connection just don't be confused by it because a few people this time around were slightly confused to the effect that uh, we were doing stories based on that TV show no. and that's really no, no, not no. the case uh-uh. uh, Billy Craig the guy who came up with doing uh, Hanging Monkey was a fan of the show I mean let's 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 you know be honest here that was easily the inspiration uh, for him creating the hanging monkey and uh, what is it O'Brien's bar on Matubra all right so that you have all these these as we talk roguish figures uh, there's O'Brien himself the ex-irish uh, patriot who owns and runs the bar he has a giant island bodyguard. A uh, young Chinese maid who uh, Miko, I believe her name is, who is a martial arts expert. And then again, we have uh, I think it's uh, Nick Fortune, who has his own ship and takes on you know various cargo runs. And a pilot whose name I'm forgetting right at the moment, but uh, he flies uh, an old uh, 1930s uh, prop plane that uh, again carries uh, contraband and and materials throughout the islands. And amongst this cast, this Bible that Billy created, these four, these other writers jumped in uh, to do these kind of old-fashioned, really, really classic pulp-type stories. So I hope you know people will check it out and and appreciate the inspiration where it came from. So there you go. Okay, and then, and then we had what? Then just this week, Airship Twenty Seven. As we're re- as we're reading this. Uh, and recording this, that just this week, Airship 27 released our fifth Jim Anthony book. The complete title is Jim Anthony Super Detective vs. Mastermind, and was written by Adam Mudman Bezekny. It is a unique book in that it is a collection of four Jim Anthony adventures, all of which are actually connected, and by the end, our heroes, still half Comanche, half Irish, and all American, confronts a deadly criminal genius in the mysterious mastermind. Uh, Richard June provides the black and white interior illustrations, and Adam Shaw uh, rendered a beautiful eye-popping cover. This this one just, I mean, his the the uh, Sherlock Holmes one he did is a, is a standout, and this is a standout. He just does great covers, uh, very pulpish. Again, this yep. is number five in our continuing new adventures of Jim Anthony, and we hope you'll check it out. Oh, amen. I, you know, I, I, I'm glad you, you underscored uh, Adam Shaw's cover. That is about as pulpy as you uh, cover. It's, it's his use of color that makes it pop like that. He knows where to put the blues. He knows where to put right. the reds. Yeah. Right? And, and that's why... When, when I saw the cover the first time, when I pulled it up on, on my PC screen and saw it, I, mean, I was tickled pink. It was like, oh, my God. I mean, this, you, you know, with the logo you designed and, and the, you know, everything else on it, the font and whatever, again, Adam's work, this is something that you could have actually put on a kiosk in downtown New York on 1935 amongst all the other classic pulp characters, and it would have fit in perfectly. Absolutely, it would have looked yeah. exactly as 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 part of that that collection of garish covers that were made specifically to grab your eye. All right, to to pick your interest and have you want to pick it up and go, okay, what the heck is this all about? What's going on? So so kudos to Adam. Uh, when I first approached him, 
And I don't know if you'll recall, Rob, but this is actually the second uh, Jim Anthony that Adam has done for us. Because what, what was he, the first did, one? Remind me. Yeah, he did the older Anthony alongside of oh, Dylan. That's for right. The real agenda. That's right. Yeah, he did that cover for us. Yes, which is so, interesting because that this this Jim Anthony cover is kind of a mostly blue, but that cover yeah. was mostly kind of orange and brown. So it's exactly. yeah, right. different feel entirely. But it's the same artist. Yeah. 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 And yeah. When, when I when I first approached him about you know asking him if he, he you know he'd want in on this project, his immediate reply to me was, "Yeah, sure, Ron. I, I really like Jim Anthony. I think he's a great character, and I'd be you know happy to be a part of the project." So, so there you go. Uh, and don't be surprised if we do future hopefully a lot more Jim Anthony books, and uh, we may go back and and uh, you know knock on Adam's door again. It's it's it's, it's a joy to see that kind of work. And to know that these artists are having so much fun with this. Absolutely. All right. So there you go. I mean, you know, I mean, in the last month, I think we've come very close to putting out a book a month. And I mean, this this goes back a to book when a week. we released a book a week. You mean, yeah? Yeah. Excuse me. Tongue tied here. Right. <laughs> I mean, pri- prior to leaving for for uh, Pittsburgh, we'd already released the Eye of Quang Chi uh, by Fred Adams, and then. Right after that, uh, the Bass Reeves uh, Frontier Lawman Volume Two. We go to Pulp Fest, come back from Pulp Fest, and now we release Tales from the Hanging Monkey Two and the new Jim Anthony book. So again, one a week. Uh, we're we're in that upward climb <laughs> as we tease our, our listeners, feast or famine. So obviously, we're in the feast section right now. Yeah, we definitely are because it. it just to kind of move on here, it says, what comes next? Well, <laughs> we're still in the middle of Feast here. Keep in mind that these titles are all in various states of final production. So as to what order they, they are ultimately, ultimately published depends solely on which one gets done first. And I repeat this for, every time we have do these podcasts. Uh, I, we can say, we can predict which ones are going to come out next and the uh, when we do our next podcast, it's there's it's nothing like what we predicted. But anyway, here's what here's what's in the lineup. The first one, and I'm I'm working on this one now actually. Captain Action Number Three: Cry of the Jungle Lord. This will most likely be our next release. Uh, he said. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and, and I I've started work on the illustrations for this third book in the series, as written by Jim Beard and Barry Reese. I've also done a composition sketch for the cover, and if approved uh, by by the folks that that uh, own the uh, the rights to Captain Action, it will be fully rendered by Canadian artist Ted Hammond. And just before this, uh, before the podcast recording, I actually I, I thought I was going to have to wait until after we'd done the recording to to do that final sketch, but I actually finished it up just before I I let you know I was online. So I'm going to as soon as we're done, I'll scan it in and send it off to the. Uh, Captain Action guys and see what they have to say. All right, uh, yeah, I, that's great. I'm, I'm, I'm tickled about that. Uh, honestly, I appreciated their input uh, because they, because from the original sketch that you and I worked out together and what you drew, uh, they, they really only wanted minor tweaks because they're, they're. I'm happy that they are keeping the same elements. Yeah. Uh, in, in the composition, which I was very, you know. Uh, devoted to putting out there because I like our books to have some significance, at least, you know, the covers, some real significance, the, the actual stories within the pages of the covers. And so, you know, like I said, between the two of us, we worked out what those elements should be. Uh, so the tweaks that uh, Joe and, and Ed asked you to uh, work on last night were, were merely sizing the elements and, and shifting yeah. them around a little bit. So. Yeah, just a little bit. Just yeah, m- minor tweaks. Uh, and, I mean, and it's good to have another set of eyes to look at something like that to to maybe yeah. help us help us see something we probably didn't see in this right. particular case. And it's th- since it's their character, they they want a certain feel on that cover. And, exactly. You know, and and for the most part, that does not you know conflict with what we're trying to do at all. So we can usually find some common ground with what what they're needing and what we need so and i i think i'm hoping this last one uh, 
that it finally hits the sweet spot for everyone. Yeah, I think right. it will. I mean, the, from what they were saying the, uh, in the last email, I think we were just you know slightly off, and I've I've tweaked it the way they they requested it, and I think we're on the money now. So we'll right. We'll, I'll, we'll know later tonight or maybe early tomorrow morning. Right, and yeah, I just wanted to add to that uh, to all our, our loyal airmen listening to this. Uh, this is something that we do quite often. Uh, in that you do detailed pencil sketches uh, based on, you know, you and I talking about what cover should be. And then we pass those along to other artists uh, who worked for us in the past. And we've done that quite often, uh, much to our delight. And you've worked with Ted Hammond already on several covers, including the Lady Action cover, uh, which we did pretty much the same way, where you worked right. out the composition, we passed it uh Past Ed and Joe got their final approval, and then on to Ted and went, and he knocked it out of the ballpark with that finished piece. Yeah, as expected, we, we knew he would, it, which is why we asked him to do uh, did it did it for uh, Lady Action, and he's he, oh, hopefully he's going to do it again. I, I, I have no doubts he could knock this one out of the park too. Uh, right. Once we get it, once we get it down to, to get it finalized, we're very so I, very close. Right, and so with fingers crossed, with fingers crossed, <laughs> once once. Rob still has to finish the interiors, as he said. Yeah. Uh, then Ted will bring the cover in. Uh, we'll have the book proofread. So it's probably still maybe two weeks away before we can see it. Uh, uh, yeah, that's officially. probably that's probably about right. Yeah, a couple of weeks maybe. It just depends on uh, on how quickly I can get the interiors done and how quickly uh, Ted can get that cover done, and then I can assemble it and have it off to the proofer proofreader. Uh, exactly. But you know, so, life intervenes sometimes. We'll see what happens. Well, yeah. So that that's that's pretty much what I consider the head of the the pack coming coming at us right now. What else is in that pack? Okay. Uh, yeah. Next on the list here is the Moon Man Volume Two, and it features stories by Greg Hatcher, Gene Moyers, Tim Bruckner, and Terry Alexander. We have a wonderful cover by Mike Files in the files. Har har har. <laughs> and, and artist Richard Richard June is busy at work on the interiors. <laughs> when when I, I read this, I didn't see that. We don't. I was, <laughs> that went right past me. Please. No, no. I, I, when I read this earlier, I, I laughed when I came across that, and I, I knew I'd have to make a pun out of it. <laughs> okay. Files is in the files. Yeah, yes, files yes. is in the files. Yes, right. But yeah, I, Richard I, I'm, Richard's I'm busy. Really anxious to get this out for no other reason than that. Uh, it's it's all too rare that we have a cover, and I mean, and we're waiting on stories. It's usually <laughs> the other way around. We've got a couple of those. We're gonna we're gonna mention another one here in a minute. So, but yeah, yeah that's but that, Mike, that is Mike, weird. Mike, yeah, Mike had sent us that. God, I want to say two years ago now. Something um, like that. Yeah, he he had done it for for another project or whatever. It it was never published. They did another one. They did two uh, Moon Man pieces, and they went with the other one. And so Mike, who's, who's the salt of the earth, and a really, really great guy, he's from England, uh, and has done some work for us years ago when we got started. And Mike came to us and said, here, I have this, this Moon Man cover, would you guys like to have it? And both Rob and I went, wow, it's just absolutely gorgeous. No, so, we're, we're not going to, we're going to turn down a really beautiful cover. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're going to turn one down. No, so, Mike, Mike does just beautiful work, so the, yeah, definitely. So. So yeah, so the thing was was we had the cover, then we got the stories, and then it was who's going to do the interiors. And ha- happily, uh, Richard John came in to do that, and this guy is fantastic. He's he's a gifted gifted artist. So now all the elements are coming together, as we said, and it's another one that's on the horizon. Okay, what's next, Rob? Okay, and th- th- this is one of those I, I mentioned earlier. It's Qu- it's Quatermain. The New Adventures, Volume 3. It's a full-length novel by Wayne Carey, the fellow we mentioned that we met at, uh, at Pittsburgh, uh, again, along with his wife, Brenda. And again, we do have the cover for this one in-house, as, as mentioned earlier. It's by Graham Hill. All we're waiting on are the interiors by newcomer, and I'm going to mispronounce his name, so just get, get ready, Dominic <laughs> Ch- Chenier. I'm, I'm going to pronounce it, but it's probably wrong. Well, it's, it's it's close. If uh, I mean, let me as a as a as Canadian a, descendant, French Canadian, Chenier, yeah, French Canadian foot here. Okay, uh, I would I would read that as Chenier. 
Shin, Shin Yir, okay. Shin Yir, right, okay. Yeah, yeah. And he, he is new to us, uh, was recommended to us by a writer, one of our regulars, uh, months ago, and is now very, very uh, dedicated working at getting those illustrations done. So once he has his illustrations done, again, it's the same thing as the Moon Man. The illustrations are done. This is a novel. Uh, once again, Rob assembles everything with the new cover by Al, uh, new Al Quatermain cover by Gray Mill, and we find the proofreader and ta da ta da ta da, and it goes on the uh, to publish and get out field. Yep. Goes to create space in Amazon and then Kindle. Yeah, yep. I mean, I, I I haven't taken account recently of how many books we have put out next uh, so far this year, but I'll have to do that for our next podcast. Yes, give us a, okay. Give us give us a feel of, of where we're at because generally, generally we usually hit the ballpark between twenty and twenty four titles a year. Yep. And and right now, again, because of the pace we're at, I think we're we're, we're going to do that again. All right. Yep. Let's, I think we're close. I think we're close. Right. But anyway, and then the next, and then two more here. And two weird westerns. Uh, we we also have Six Gun Terrors Volume Three by Fred Adams Jr. Uh, we mentioned Fred earlier. How he's become very prolific, and here's another example of that. He's on Volume Three already of Six Gun Terrors, and with Art Cooper doing the interiors. and And the second one is The Silver Riders by Greg Hatcher and Chris Kohler, doing a magnificent bag. If I could say it. Magnificent job on the interiors. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. We, we haven't decided this yet. Who will do the cover for these two great books? Uh, right. So it, this is one where we don't have the covers. But we have we at least have the creative team on the inside. So right. those two are coming. Yeah, uh, and I'll give you a heads up real quick uh, because again, Six Gun Terrors is a series. All right, and this is book three in that series. Uh, we were really lucky enough to get Zach Bruner to do the covers for one on uh, one and two, and you remember how we done them like a right, uh, yeah. a, a co-joined cover with the same Western uh, city background, old, old right, old ghost town background. But anyways, Zach did the cover for those two books, and he's really good at doing horror. And right. whereas this is a weird Western, and easily Rob of the three because I've read and edited this. All right. This one, this one will give people nightmares. Let me tell you, okay. So <laughs> okay. that being the case, I'm, I'm strongly considering uh, getting a hold of Zach and seeing if he's available uh, to give us some some. Well, then time. maybe then maybe we can turn it into a triptych since it'll yeah, have, yeah, you know. It, it, I, I don't I, I don't know if we'll go that route because again, yeah. this is a different one. It, it, the, just to explain to our listeners, uh, Six One Terrors is the story of two. Uh, veterans of the Civil War who end up in Texas working on a huge cattle ranch. And like it or not, for whatever bad luck, karma they have, they are constantly getting involved with all kinds of weird, demonic alien things or Native American monsters, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the only thing I'll say about uh, the third volume, Rob, <laughs> it deals with snakes. Oh, lovely. <laughs> oh, like I said. Lovely. Right, this one, yeah, this one gave me the creeps from beginning to end, so there you go. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, so there you go. That's, that's pretty much a, a, a handful, and again, <coughs> just a handful, of, of some of the books that we are working on uh, for Airship 27 that we really hope to get out uh, between now and the end of the year, and, and whatever else uh, we can squeeze in there, whatever we have time for. But... Uh, people should also keep in mind that you know we have other projects that we work on, uh, and I'm gonna. That's why I added this Attention. last agenda here. Podcast can, recording. Yes, we're <laughs> recording the podcast. Thank you, computer. <laughs> God, we, we we have a new co-host that I wasn't aware of. Huh? Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's the Airship 27 AI. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I mean, as as could, I'll, I'll just give it the agenda, Rob. But we can just sit back. There and you go. It. Let it read it. Yeah, there. But <laughs> so, yeah, so again, moving ahead for all the other things that are, are floating out there. Why don't you take the next item? Okay, and and from Ron and Rob, 
uh, after I finish up the work on Captain Action Three, uh, I will be I'll be doing illustrations for Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective Volume Ten. Uh, after this, I will take on the illustrations for Mystery Men and Women Volume Six. And if it, and if I can find a minute or two, I'll be doing pages for the one shot Secret Agent X comic book, which has been on the back burner and comes off for a day or two and then goes back on the back burner for probably three years, maybe four now. But uh, yeah, I'd kind of like to get that finished because we're getting down to I'm getting down to the uh, the uh, denouement of the uh, of the story, so it's it's getting exciting in the story. So it'll be it'll be fun to. Finish up those pages. I, I'm hoping to get that done soon. So anyway, but Ron, yeah, is, yeah I mean, they, you're good. Go ahead. Okay, go ahead. You're going to talk about it. Go ahead. No, I, I just, no, I just wanted to, to add to that. Uh, yeah, the Secret Agent X comic book is fantastic, and I really want to tease the hell out of all our <laughs> listeners because I think it's some of the best work you've ever done. You're in the climatic final pages right. of the action now, right? Which right. is what you were just drumming about. And I'm excited, too. I, I'm really anxious for this comic to come out. Uh, and the other thing that you mentioned here, uh, aside from you know the, the various titles, yes, we are going to get another Sherlock Holmes anthology out before the end of the year, Volume 10, which we, again, have another cover sitting you know, and waiting for this. And that is by, again, our good friend Graham Hill. Uh, there was some thought as to whether we do two consulting detectives this year, but to be quite honest, uh, the overwhelming success of Volume 9 caught me and Rob by surprise, okay? Honestly, we knew the books were selling good. The previous eight volumes have all done stellar, all right, and, and brought all of us, you know, a, a great deal of, of, of satisfaction besides royalties, if you will, to the creators, the artists, the writers. But we still weren't ready for the leap that Volume 9 took. And that's the one Rob had alluded to earlier with the great Adam Shaw cover. Yes. That thing just sold through the roof. I, 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 I attribute some of its sales to that great cover he did. I, I oh really think it stands out. Right, because of right. It. And so, yeah, so that being the case, okay, that, that old, old adage about strike while the iron is hot, <laughs> right? We all realize, okay, we're making our, we are obviously making our Sherlock Holmes fans very happy. We're not going to disappoint him. We're giving him a second volume. So keep your fingers crossed. Number 10 is on its way. Yeah, this fall sometime. Well, not not sure when. As always, we say this is what's coming, but then, you know, there's stuff that jumps in the way. So we'll see what happens. But that's on, that's on my agenda. There you go. So All right, anyway. you can pick it up where you left off. All friend. right. I was before I was so rudely interrupted. <laughs> I, was, I, I just said politely interrupted. Okay, excuse okay. me. So before I was so politely interrupted, <laughs> Ron is currently writing the next collection of Brother Bone stories, and we hope to have that book out by the end of the year. Once finished with that, he'll tackle his second Lady Action novella. So he's going to be busy too. Uh, along with editing and, and proofreading some of the books as they come across the transom. And then he moves on to Mark Justice's The Dead Sheriff, number two, one I'm really looking forward to. I, I, I think your, uh, your excitement about the character and your love for uh, Mark Justice, uh, will, I think this one's going to really get knocked out of the park. So anyway, before his passing, Mark had begun a second novel, and Ron will be completing it. And uh, like I said, I'm looking forward to that. I think that's that's going to be a lot of fun. I well, you know, yeah, I, I am too. Uh, again, and it's going to be personal, as as you just you know described wonderfully. Uh, losing Mark was 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 a real real blow to that everybody in, yeah. in our community. Yeah, uh, a great a great guy, uh, a wonderful human being, and an amazing talent. And after publishing uh, reprint, I should say reprinting, the Dead Sheriff number one. Uh, in reading and editing it, uh, I realized that Mark and I, in a lot of ways, have the same approach to writing. Our styles are not all all that different. And that being the case, uh, you know, initially you and I had talked about the fact that you know I, I was going to have to work out who would who would target to, to finishing his second book, which he had started as you just recounted before he passed away. And after after reading. The first one, it dawned on me that I'm the guy to do this, okay? And so 
Uh, yeah, I, I working on Brother Bones, having a ball doing that as I always do because I, I love that character. Uh, get back to Lady Action uh, for Joe and Ed and the good people at Captain Action Enterprises because again another fun character. But yeah, the, the real the real thing I'm longing to do and, and I'm excited about and scared Rob a little <laughs> bit. You know, all right, it's 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 a daunting task. All right. Sure. Uh, since, since his passing, you and I have become very, very good friends with Mark's widow, Norma Kay. Yeah. And so I need to. I need this to be right. I need to complete Dead Sheriff Two the way Mark would have wanted it done. And you know, fingers crossed, his spirit will be watching me when I tackle that. Yeah, thing. he'll probably be looking over your shoulder. Just don't, don't look back too often. You might scare you or something. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, yeah, I can I can understand why that would be daunting. That would that would be a little bit. But I think uh, I think you can pull it off. I, I think that after with with Norma uh, with her on our side and and with Mark looking looking down and and kind of pushing this along, I think you'll I think you'll do it. I think you'll uh, pull this off. So I'm, I'm right. really looking forward to this. I well, am. thank you. I, I, Rob, as ever, I, I really appreciate that that support a great deal. All right, and uh, I'll let you read the last agenda. Okay, personal appearances. Uh, I combed my hair. No, wait a minute. Uh, <laughs> though my a little, uh, little, little cream, a little dab. Will yeah, do a little you. dab will do you. <laughs> <laughs> and you young folks, you have no idea what we're talking about. But anyway. Though, no, though we just my, dated ourselves. No, big years. time. Yeah, uh, though, though my convention schedule is complete for 2017. I had I had other conventions that I had been going to, and both of them kind of got uh, got canceled or, or whatever. I think the uh, the convention scene is at a plateau, and, and some conventions are making it, and others aren't. So we've lost a couple of them along the way. So my year is done as far as convention schedules go. Although I'll be looking at it for the next year, I'll be looking around to see if there's some other things I can do. But anyway, that's not so for Captain Ron. On August 26th and 27th, he'll be a guest at the Fort Collins Comic Con, held pretty much in his backyard. Wow. <laughs> in your backyard? Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, we're, we're, we're literally talking maybe five miles away from where I live. <laughs> cool. So, yeah. yeah. So, anyway, then. From September 27th to October 1st, he'll be a guest down in Denver at the Rocky Mountain Con. And finally, come October 7th, he will be in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska for a one-day comic event at a shopping mall there. So, no rest for the captain as yet. I'll be at home, I'll be at home plugging away on our books, and you'll be out there pushing him at the shows. So that'll That's work. It. Yep, you get it. One two punch. Uh, yeah, I, the Scotts Bluff thing came as a real surprise um, because earlier in the year, Valerie and I had gone up to Cheyenne, uh, Wyoming, uh, and for for folks who aren't familiar with uh, Colorado, we live in the northern part of Colorado. We're actually right on the border with uh, the southern border, of Wyoming, and Cheyenne's an hour drive away from here. So. Last year, um, folks up there started their own Comic Con, and it was a huge success. And this year, I, you know, was happy to get an invitation to be a guest. So Val and I took a ride up and spent the weekend in Cheyenne. We had a ball. It was, it was a great show. It was a lot of fun. And apparently met this young guy there who was putting on this one-day comic show. Uh, he was from Nebraska. So when I got his invitation in the mail, Rob, it's like, you know, I initially read, you know, we're having this show in a mall. You guys will be set up in the mall. Uh, they're giving us free tables. Bring your stuff. We want to make this a fun day for the people in the mall. All the shop owners are excited about it, having comic creators there, whatever. And we'd love to have you come and be a guest. So I read Nebraska, and then I'm thinking, well, geez, this is, isn't that a little for smartphone, right, Rob? And immediately goes to, like, MapQuest. Yeah, punches it in, turns around and shows it to me. It's it's basically two and a half hours away from Fort Collins here. Well, that's not so bad. That, yeah, that's a no brainer. That was like really two and a half hours. That's it. So uh, happily, uh, another person who was invited uh, is a friend that you know quite well. Our our uh, other buddy here in Fort Collins and the guy I call my protege, Todd Jones. Right. Uh, Todd got an invite as well. 
So both of us met for coffee a couple of days later. We were talking about this, and so we're I'm jumping in his van with him, and, and we're going up to Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. Yeah, that's about as, yeah, it's about the same distance it is for me to go to, to Kansas City for Planet Comic Con. It's about a two a two and a half hour drive for us. So that's yeah, that's a good drive. That's perfect. Perfect to the show. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, yeah, for a one day show. You know, we'll get up early in the morning. We'll make the drive. We'll set up. We'll have a good time, and hopefully, you know, be back a little after dinner that night. So there I'm, you go. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. Yeah. It, what are, you're doing something else too this fall. You didn't put oh, this on okay. the agenda. I. No, but I, I'm going to I'm going to bring it up. <laughs> Please go right ahead, Professor. Professor Ron Fortier. <laughs> Tell us all about it, Ron. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, what I am doing, what Rob, Rob is, is hinting at and teasing at and, and, and wanting me to talk about is that after writing comics for, for close to 50 years, maybe 46, 47 now, we're pushing the 50 mark, all right? Uh, during that course of time, I... I have given a lot, a lot of grade school and high school presentations. I've actually done workshops with high school teachers. Rob and I even did uh, graphic novel, uh, how to do graphic novel presentations to professional writers down in Oklahoma one time. Right. So, uh, you know, I, we do this. We ultimately get to do these kind of things if you're a professional in the business. And... In the back of my mind, there was always this, this thought that, you know, wouldn't it be fun to do this in a college setting, to give an actual course, say, you know, and, and lo and behold, all right, thanks to things like the Marvel comic movies and whatever, comics today are much more accepted uh, by the academic community as legitimate literature. And many of our colleagues, Rob, are teaching courses across the country. So, sure enough, uh, I hooked up with... Uh, people at a small community college here in Fort Collins called the Front Range Community College. They have campuses, I believe, on four different sites throughout uh, Colorado. And I introduced myself to their uh, director of continuing adult education. She's a charming lady. Her name is Lori Rue. And basically the end result of all this was Come uh, September 27th, I will be teaching a class on comic book scripting. It will be an eight-week course uh, that will run every Wednesday night from 7 to 8.30 and will end on November the 15th, the week before Thanksgiving. And, Rob, uh, again, th thanks for the floor to, to shout this out. Uh, I'm, I'm and we'll, by it. We'll have, uh, we'll have Sparky put... Uh, there, there's probably a, a link that he, he can put in the, in the show notes for us that uh, if anybody in the area wants to wants to sign up for this class, hearing hearing our voices now that's in the Colorado Fort Collins area and wants to take this class, we'll, uh, we'll talk to Sparky and see if he can't put a link to that in the show notes. Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, it, exactly. We'll definitely do that. Uh, just so you know, Rob, about five, five or six minutes before you, you hit the Skype button to get a hold of me, I actually got a uh, letter from uh, Lori Rue at the college. Yeah. And just made you know all this known this past week. And we've got one person signed up. Yay! <laughs> number so, one. <laughs> number one. But again, so you have until September, I guess it was September 27th. And when okay. I read the 27 number, I knew that was a real good There opening. you go. <laughs> yep. I'm, I'm finally going to be teaching a class on comic writing. Cool. And hey, uh, before we wrap all this up, I do want to give Sparky a plug, which is which he really deserves. Uh, this past week, Rob, uh, our good friend Brant Fowler, who, who allows us to do this show every month, uh, set up a Patreon page for the Zone 4 family of podcasts. And that, mm. what that means, folks, is that now there will be a page where if you like any of the, I think I think Brant's now uh, showcasing at least with ours, six different podcasts, Rob. Wow. And of course, as you know, all right, none of this is free. You have to pay for, <laughs> for air time and, and site time and all that. So, hey, contribute on a monthly basis, whether it's a dollar, two dollars, or whatever, to help out, to help to help keep the, the shows alive. And Brand's hope 
is that as time goes on, uh, he and all the other hosts of the various podcasts, including you, me and you, my friend, uh, might be able to offer some unique little uh, prizes for people uh, who are kind enough to sign on as patrons of the Zone 4 family. And if, if nothing else, Rob, uh, who knows, maybe on, on some future show, if, if somebody is kind enough to donate and, and help keep the Zone 4 family of the podcast alive, we'll give them a shout-out on the show. Yeah. Sure. You know? and, and we'll tip off the door to them. You know, those kind of things, all right? So there you go. Uh, if you enjoy Airship 27, the podcast, and you'd like to see us stay on the air for another 30 episodes and whatnot, then, then consider. Uh, I'm sure Brant will have the link to his uh, Patreon page. And so there you have it, my friend. Um, looking at the clock, and I think we're just kissing that one hour One mark. hour. Yeah, we're right on the one hour mark, yes. So I guess it's time for us to sign out and say good night. So I'm Rob, Chief Engineer of Airship 27, Rob Davis, signing off and asking Captain Ron to say, as I always do, down ship. This has been a Gonzo Goose production. Bonk!